All right. Can everybody hear me? Fine. Looks like. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction and the uh, invitation to Barcelona. It's, uh, I realize it's uh, as nice weather as we have in California. <laughs> <laughs> um, as uh, Thomas mentioned, we um, uh, it's been a couple of years now that we found uh, that three transcription factors, <coughs> ASA1, Brain2, and Bit1, like, are able to convert fibroblasts directly into um, functional neurons. And these cells not only look uh, beautiful, and you can stain them with various markers, as I said, they are functional. They, they have these two principal properties of uh, neurons. They can fire action potentials and form uh, synaptic, synaptic connections. And a lot of effort in the lab is really dedicated to this question how, how this, this uh, remarkable uh, um, conversion from a boring looking, I'm not saying boring, boring looking fibroblast to this very elegant uh, cell type of a highly complex uh, a neuron can actually be accomplished with just these three transcription factors. Um, so one thing that we noticed early on was that unlike the sort of conventional IPS that reprogramming, um, the efficiencies uh, that we get with, uh, without doing any fancy um, uh, stuff like low oxygen or small molecule inhibitors is actually already quite high, at least in, in, mouse, in a mouse system, in, in particular with, uh, when you work with uh, embryonic fibroblasts. So um, the, uh, we estimate that the efficiencies uh, can be as high as about 20% of the starting cell population. About When you plate 100 cells, 20 of them will actually become these, these neuronal-like cells or induced neuronal cells or N cells. And also, when you look at uh, re or um, induction of neuronal genes, we see the, um, them to be induced r really rapidly. And when you look, use sensitive assays such as FACS, as, as, as cytometry, we see, uh, in this case, tau being induced as early as 24 hours after the induction of, of the transgenes in a small proportion of the cells. So it seems to be a very rapid and, and quite efficient process. And um, unlike uh, IPS cell reprogram again, it doesn't seem to be involving a lot of stochastic events. In those 20% of the cells that reprogram, they <coughs> seem to reprogram in a very uh, synchronous manner and not like IPS cell reprogram where you see like colonies appearing over long, long periods of time. Here is a measurement of, um, of uh, an analysis of a, of, a, of a live movie where we monitored the appearance of tau GFP positive cells over a time course up to 14 days. And as you can see, it really seems like the entire population in synchrony induces this, this marker within a short period of time. And then once the cells are expressing tau, they sort of hang around there and, and mature further into, into neurons. But no, not more uh, tau GFP cells are appearing. So, um, just from these, these uh, descriptions of, the, uh, uh, of, of, the, of these two different reprogram systems, they seem to be quite, quite different. So, um, one of the first things we asked uh, is, well, you know, how do these reprogram factors accomplish this task, and where are they actually landing in the fibrous genome? Very briefly after their induction. So we looked at, um, because we use a doxycycline inducible system, which is somewhat s slow, so we used uh, a 48 hour time point and asked uh, using a chip seek experiment, um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this with these kind of data, and plotted here in uh, uh, listed per, per intensity, or sorted by intensity, where um, um, ASL1 in this case is, is, is binding in fibroblasts in the context of uh, all three transcription factors. And we compared this list to where AC1 is actually bound um, in its most physiological um, counterpart in neural stem cells or neural precursor cells. And the remarkable uh, finding was that the binding pattern is very, very similar. So it looks like that um, AC1 is almost uh, ignoring, if you want, the, um, the chromatin state <coughs> in, in this fibroblast and goes right into its proper targets, and, and can access its proper targets, just like it does it in, in uh, neural precursor cells, where, uh, which are cells which are you know, poised to differentiate into neurons, very, very unlike fibroblasts, which of course have never, are never meant to, uh, to become neurons later in development. And interestingly, these, uh, this property of accessing uh, the proper sites is independent of the other two transcription factors. So when we express ACE1 alone in fibroblasts and do the same experiment, 
uh, do a Chipsic experiment, again, the um, binding pattern is, is very similar. Um, so that sort of smells like um, um, what Ken Zaret uh, uh, told you earlier about, um, it could perhaps be a, a pioneer factor. Um, when you do a geoterm analysis, all these sites are really close to neuronal genes. So you, you, would, you would think that uh, these sites ought to be closed uh, and nuclear, uh, packaged in, in nucleosomes. And, um, and one explanation is that ACE1 is acting like a pioneer factor and access these closed sites. The alternative is that these sites happen to be accessible uh, in, in this particular embryonic uh, fibroblast. Uh, that, that, we, that we use. So to, to distinguish between these two possibilities, we did two assays, two complementary approaches. We used um, a fair seq uh, analysis, which is another method to, uh, to map nucleosome of, of free regions, and just plot the fair seq signal at the um, AC1 targets in uh, so the fair seq signal of fibroblasts before they're, they're seen any transcription factors. And as you can see, the majority of the ac one target sites are actually uh, depleted, suggesting that they are actually um, bound by nucleosomes. It's actually nucleosomal DNA. And we did the complementary approach as well, um, where we pulled down the, um, uh, with H3 antibodies, the nucleosomal associated DNA, sequenced that, and again plotted the uh, ac one targets here, and you here see a clear enrichment. So it's very clear that an ac one in this cellular context of, of a fibroblast can access uh, targets which were previously uh, closed, in a closed state, um, um, fulfilling the criteria of, of being a, a pioneer factor. Unlike other pioneer factors, such as OCT4 um, and SOX2, they seem to be able to access their proper targets right away. Um, so that's why we like to call it an on-target pioneer factor. Yet, there's something unique about these sites. I just threw this slide in for, for Thomas Graf, um, where we, we asked, is there anything s specific about these AC1 target sites in, 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 in the chromatin? The first things we did, we downloaded a lot of ENCODE data and some uh, data we generated ourselves and just plotted uh, various uh, marks and histone modifications and, and saw there is an enrichment of two active marks, H3 core a K4 monomethylation and H3K27 acetylation mark, which is maybe um, to be expected. But also there was a clear um, enrichment, average enrichment of a repressive mark in purple, H3K9 trimethylation mark. And we went on to uh, use various methods, both a computational approach that I show here with a, uh, using a hidden Markov model algorithm uh, published, I think, by Bing, Bing Ren a couple of years ago. Um, and also biochemically that uh, provides further evidence that this, these three histone marks can actually coexist on, this, on the same histones on, on these sites. All right, so how about um, the second transcription factor, BRAIN2? Uh, we did the exact same experiment. We did uh, CHIP-seq in fibroblasts and in neural stem cells and completely unlike AC1, Brain 2 binds uh, very, very different sites in fibroblasts than in, than in, neuro, uh, in neuro stem cells. This is just a, a, a representation of this. And when you uh, look for motifs, um, intriguingly, you find a Brain 2 motif in the, or reassuringly, I should say, a Brain 2 motif in the uh, proper targets in neuro stem cells. And you don't get such a thing, um, such a motif. In the, in the brain 2 targets in fibroblasts. Instead, you get something more closely resembling an EPOX motif, which is uh, by, bound by ASL1. So we uh, speculated that perhaps ASL1 is somehow recruiting brain 2 to a sub, to a, uh, to a, to a sub fraction of, of these brain 2 target sites. And um, we actually uh, see by chip seek about 25% overlap of the brain 2 target sites and, and AC1, and also we can do co um, chip IP experiments demonstrating there is there is actually overlap between those two. And I, don't, I think for time reasons, I, yes, I took out this slide, but we also did brain 2 chip seek um, where we express uh, just brain 2 alone in fibroblasts and can uh, and compare that to brain 2 together with AC1 and can actually see this. this uh, um, this recruitment of brain 2 only when the ASA1 is present to, to those sites. 
So that is, uh, as I understand, also a second um, characteristic of pioneer factors, that they are not only able to, to bind nucleosomal DNA, but they can actually also recruit and help other transcription factors to, 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 to access those, those sites. All right, so how about the third transcription factor, mid one like that is a very, um, to us, a very interesting uh, uh, transcription factor. Not much is known about it. Uh, when we first described the uh, IN cell conversion, there were just four PubMed entries uh, uh, about this gene. Now there's a couple more, but um, so it's not really, not really well studied. It's um, one member of a family of three genes. Um, MIT1 is the sort of the gene that gave, gave the family the name because of this, this domain, the MIT1 domain, and there's a third member, NCF3. It's a zinc finger domain um, containing proteins, or presumably a, a transcription factor. Um, it's not a, a, the canonical zinc finger structure, it's not a CCHH, but it's a CCHC, so it's a somewhat special uh, zinc finger domain, which, which are all very, very similar course, uh, in, 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 this, in, the, in these three genes. So first, uh, we wanted to um, somewhat verify that we are actually dealing with, uh, uh, with, with a transcription factor. And assuming that uh, the zinc finger domains are actually the DNA binding domains, we first um, more or less randomly took uh, this uh, cluster of zinc fingers here um, and mutated the um, a, uh, the amino acids which were um, predicted to actually touch the DNA um, and asked whether this construct still can make N cells. I don't show you the, the raw data, so the, the plus indicates that the uh, um, N cell formation assay, so to say, works. So um, the uh, point mutations here didn't do anything uh, in, in response to, um, or didn't uh, change the function of AS1 at all. But of course, uh, we knew there is these uh, three zinc fingers here and there's still one zinc finger there which presumably um, can still bind DNA. So we essentially just chopped off these other uh, domains so we were left with just those two and when we now mutate uh, the, the zinc fingers, both of them, now mid one like cannot uh, function anymore and the same is true when you delete the, uh, uh, the two zinc fingers. So it, we think uh, this is uh, evidence that it is actually a transcription factor, by the way, all these uh, mutants, uh, they are still in nuclear, uh, have a nuclear lo localization, and um, we think this uh, is actually working, is, is working like a transcription factor, and DNA binding is, is important. So how about the localization of, of, this, uh, of this factor? We actually initially reported using um, flag-tagged versions of mid one like that it is very hard to do chip seek uh, for this transcription factor, at least with, with these methods, and we got only a very small number of peaks, which were actually only very uh, little enriched, only two-fold enrichment, uh, and uh, with a still overall quite high force discovery rate. So we didn't really do much with, with this data set. We were not really confident about it. So we decided to raise our own antibody, um, and that uh, worked out um, very well. It was uh, Moritz Moll in lab who, who uh, re-spearhead this project, and this antibody uh, is now beautifully um, uh, uh, can be beautifully used for, for all assays, Western blotting, um, staining, as well as, as ChIP-seq. So now we can um, uh, do ChIP-seq experiments for, for mid one leg, and uh, again look where it is bound in, 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 in fibroblasts, both uh, in full length uh, in combination with our transcription factors or uh, our, our various mutants, and also compare now where mid one leg is bound in, in the mouse brain. I, I forgot to tell you that uh, mid one leg is very specifically expressed in essentially all early post-mutotic neurons. So we can actually uh, take uh, entire brain tissue um, and do chip seek uh, on that uh, because we essentially only would get signal from, from neurons. It's, it's not, it's not uh, uh, in, in your stem cells or glia cells or uh, other brain, brain cell types there. And as you can see, surprisingly, similarly to AC1, again, the, the binding pattern seems to be very similar. Um, but, um, in, in all these cases, but this is early days. We still don't know, we don't have, um, for technical reasons, we couldn't align it with the FairSeq data yet and, and so forth. So it more needs to be analyzed. But it was also very nice to see that the motif that is significantly enriched in, in, in the most significant uh, sites here is very, very similar to motif that was published many years ago on, the, on, the, uh, uh, on a single uh, gene enhancer uh, using um, 
general mobility shift um, essays. So how about the um, transcriptional output of, of mid one leg? We did um, gene expression arrays. I think it was, no, it was, I think it's an RNA-seq experiment um, where we compare uh, fibroblasts. So the, the heat map here in, in, in red are the genes which are induced compared to control fibroblasts in green are repressed. And we just induce a bit one like, um, you see that actually the majority of the, uh, of the genes are, are repressed. Actually, those are just the bit one like predict or the bit one like bound um, uh, genes uh, computationally inferred that those are the, the, the genes uh, uh, where the blood bound sets are. So it looks like um, that the majority of the transcription output is actually repression. And that was quite puzzling to us because uh, we considered our program factors as really active transcription factors. You know, how can you explain um, that you can uh, do such a dramatic conversion as uh, converting a fibroblast to a neuron by just repressing uh, genes? You, would, you know, it, it would have to be repressing a repressor and, and that should, should induce or would have to induce dramatic gene, gene expression. So we couldn't really uh, uh, wrap our brain ar around this and so we really want to go uh, this, uh, into this a little deeper and that's why Fused um, made chimeric proteins, Fused uh, the DNA binding domain that we had worked out earlier with just a little bit of, of unfunctional uh, adjacent domains to uh, trans a transcriptional repressor, the ingrained repressor and the transcription activator, a VP64 a domain, and, and ran this, these constructs through our N cell assay again. And surprisingly, uh, it's clear that uh, the repression alone is not completely sufficient, but when in, in, both, uh, in, both dif in two different assays, when we measured uh, beta 3 tubulin or TOG1 uh, positive cells or tau GFP positive cells, there is a significant improvement um, over AEC1 alone reprogramming with just the repressor alone. Whereas uh, the, uh, the activating construct seemed to have a dominant effect. It, it's, it's even worse than when you reprogram cells with, with uh, AEC1 AS1 alone. So clearly the repressive function of mid one leg is, is, is dominant, is much more important um, than, than the activating function, even though both need to be there to um, to, to have the reprogram process um, um, efficient. So our current model is that, or attempts to explain this, is that perhaps, um, I didn't share you uh, these type of data with you, but ACE1 is clearly a strong activating uh, transcription factor, and it even seems to induce uh, unrelated programs such as myo programs, um, um, or sort of myolineage uh, programs. So perhaps the main function of mid one leg is to sort of tame uh, this wild beast of, of ALC1 and, and, and sort of ensure that only sort of the proper neuronal program is induced rather than um, um, inducing a neuronal program by itself. All right, so um, I would like to share some more uh, recent data uh, with you as well, which um, is about single cell um, RNA sequencing of, of this process. And we really started these, uh, this, this, uh, this, this technique uh, very skeptically, I must say, but uh, really driven by the, by the, um, the problem that we always, uh, are, are always faced with these beautiful genomic assays that we have to use lots and lots of cells. So all these uh, RNA-seq and chip-seq studies that I showed you, they were, of course, uh, done with <coughs> millions and millions of cells. And I told you the reprogram efficiency is about 20% which is high in one respect, but also low um, uh, in, 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 in respect to um, only a small, major, a small minority of the cells um, actually will reprogram, but we measure 80% um, uh, or uh, among the population are 80% which will not reprogram. Right? So, so how can we be sure that all these uh, beautiful chip seek uh, data that we generate and the conclusions we draw are actually true because the majority of cells will not reprogram? So we thought one uh, way to address this is to look at the transcription output, which is possible with, uh, you know, on a single cell level, coupled with RNA-seq. So it is a very simple experiment first, where we um, um, did a single, uh, single cell uh, RNA-seq experiment on control fibroblasts, in, shown in dark uh, green, and cells which were infected with ASA1 for two days. And then 
throw it on the sequencer and um, uh, got back this, this heat map. And very nicely, the uh, cells sorted themselves uh, into the two experimental groups. So uh, in, this, in this cluster here, made out of A and B, uh, are the majority, um, or actually all, of the, uh, of the uninfected cells. And there are a couple infected cells scattered in here too, but they turn out to be not being infected. They, don't, they actually did not induce um, ASA1. And then in the ones which actually did uh, um, induce ASA1, they actually were infected, there's two clusters. One cluster, um, this uh, um, cluster C here, doesn't seem to do a, such a good job of inducing the ASA1 program which are, which are uh, marked with, with or, or in this gene cluster here. And they also don't do such a good job of silencing these fibroblast genes here. Whereas the cluster D here um, does a much better job of inducing these, this cluster of genes here, which is not on in, in fibroblast, and also does a better job at in, uh, silencing these fibroblast genes here. So um, it looks like that at this early time point, the majority of the transcription response of, uh, of ASA1 is actually quite homogeneous. The majority of the cells respond to ASA1 quite well. And we think that it must be later stages in the reprogram process that explain the low reprogram efficiencies overall. And uh, one um, quite nice correlation actually is simply the levels of ASA1. The cluster C cells here have a sort of an average medium induction level of ASA1, whereas the uh, cells in cluster D have a much, much higher uh, ASA1 level. So it could be just as simple as you need a, a certain threshold of your program factors before you can properly activate and silence, uh, activate the target program and silence the, the donor program. It could be as simple as that. So we also looked at later stages, uh, at day five, uh, shown in, in, in lighter green here, and day 22, shown in, 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 ver in very dark green. And um, there's a couple, th you know, a couple things that we, um, that we, can, um, that we can see from, from, this, from this heat map. So of course, there's, a lot, there's, there's lots of data, so it takes some while to, to, to look at this. On, on the, on the right-hand side here, I've blown up, um, essentially, you can maybe focus on this here, it's, which, is, which, which is a marker, is it, the tau GFP um, RNA seq uh, signal here, so the um, essentially the levels of tau expression, and here is, is ASA1. So let's maybe start with this cluster down here, um, which are uh, made out of purely uh, the late stage cells, and those genes here are the neuronal targets, synaptic genes, and so forth. So they induce this this. Uh, this, this gene is quite well. And also there are some neural uh, genes down here which, which are induced. Um, and interestingly, uh, on day five, there, there, are, there are clusters which, which um, tend to induce these clusters here as well, this and, and, and this here as well. And uh, um, they, they cluster with some cells from day 22 um, together. But there is another set at day, day five which look completely different they, they still have a, this gigantic block um, expressed here, which is silenced uh, in, the, in the sort of mature ion cells, and then subclusters um, uh, that, that start to induce this, this program or, or not. And then there are things with, that we don't really, really understand. But what, one thing that, that sort of stood out out of this was there's a pretty good correlation of the, uh, both the tau expression level and, and ASA1 induction again, and sort of the, failure, if you want, to, to, uh, to reprogram. And this is sort of summarized in the, um, this is my last slide, uh, in, this, uh, in this principal component analysis, um, which shows you all data put together. Um, and the, uh, the two main principal components are shown, of, of course, and that, that, uh, that defines the coordinates. But in color, like the color code indicates the levels of, of, of ASA1. And just like our impression from the heat maps, um, we, we think that there's a couple of examples that you can, can trace here now is that there is a very tight correlation between the, in, uh, how well you induce ASA1 and how far you get in the, in the, in the reprogramming. So if you just look at these uh, colors here, there's the squares of the D2 cells, and there's a pretty nice correlation. The further you're down on this, on this reprogramming line, if you want the reprogramming path, the more orange the, uh, the signal is, the more ASA1 is expressed. 
And we also see that on day five, which are these, these triangles, there's a couple of cells that downregulate AC1. For whatever reason, somehow it seems to be that the lentiviral system is not perfect and, and there's some silencing going on and those seem to just shoot off. Maybe they revert back, they, but they are still very close with the cells that induce them. So they're clearly not uninfected fibroblasts or, or fibroblasts anymore. They seem to have given a, uh, or, or seen a dose of AC1 and they're different, uh, but uh, AC1 is gone now and they can't maintain the, uh, they can't stay on, on the path anymore. And then uh, the, sa the, same, the same you see on day five and day 22 with, with the levels. Up here are the mature end cells, but that's not, uh, AC1 cannot explain everything. Sorry, I'm, I always get excited with this. I, let me just say this, this one last thing, <laughs> that um, the, uh, there's also other things, so we cannot explain everything with just uh, uh, the AC1 levels. Very clearly there's another path here uh, which is completely the wrong direction, even though uh, AS1 is, is expressed to, to really high levels. So the reporting system in principle is, is working. So there's much more that we have to, to learn, and um, I have to thank all the people that were, were involved in this. Uh, Chen um, uh, was both involved in the uh, original uh, genomic study and now in the single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, Orly, um, a student at Howard Cheng's lab, was, was helping her initially, and the single cell um, analysis done together with Steve Quake and, and Barbara Tritlein. I mentioned uh, Moritz, who did the, the mid one like um, the mid one like studies, and uh, I thank you for for your. Um,